everyone and welcome to old news where the fossils are old but discoveries are new my name is laura beth i'm going to be your host today so i'm going to keep an eye on our live chat where you can type in questions and comments we would love to hear from you um, and just in case you're new to old news i do want to let you know that you can um, put on some of those automatic live captions by hovering your mouse over the video and clicking on the button that says cc and we have old news bingo for you. Um, if you didn't register and you don't have the printouts, you can use that link that I put in the chat and you can play some old news bingo throughout this program. And of course, here to share his expertise is the museum's research curator of paleontology, Dr. Christian Kammerer. Woo! Hey, Christian. <laughs> Hi, Laura Beth. <laughs> Great to be here on this fine November day. It really is, actually. After last yeah. week, we had horrible cold weather, and now it's nice and, and in the 70s and sunny, and I love it. <laughs> well, I liked when it was colder, but, you know, I'll, I'll take 70. <laughs> well, I'm really excited to learn about the news today. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think we left it kind of a mystery for folks what we're going to be talking about. What exactly are moss animals? Yeah, well, I mean, we looked uh, we looked at the numbers. We see what's driving clicks for the program, and it's people want more obscure invertebrate phyla. It's like dinosaurs get that get that junk out of here. We want obscure invertebrates, so we're going to continue with that uh, full on today. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, looking at these creatures called moss animals. Uh, and they actually like they're one of those groups that's a little difficult to recognize as creatures at all at first let me bring up some photos of these things um so i mean this is something that you might see at the seashore uh so let's say you're looking at a at a, a rock that's washed up or a piece of driftwood or in this case this is a a piece of seaweed some kelp uh, and you might see this sort of white uh, interconnected lattice like almost uh you know looking a little bit like a doily or something i mean something lacy uh and it's actually you know is a, not just an animal um but it's actually a colony of animals and so the, each of these little capsules or compartments that you see here uh, would have housed an, an individual organism. And you can see what they, they look like in this photo here. So there's kind of like a little wormy bit that comes up out of its compartment. And then this sort of, you know, feathery kind of crown, uh, almost kind of like a feather duster appearance of these little tentacles uh, covered in Siri. And these are bryozoans. So bryozoans, they're a colonial group of mostly sessile, so that means they're planted on the bottom, they're, they're motionless, uh, filter feeding organisms. Uh, they look a lot like corals, which are another filter feeding colonial invertebrate, not at all related, just very, very distantly related. So these are, these are not um, any, really anything like, like corals in terms of their, their structure, uh, but you know, in terms of their ecology and life habits, uh, there is there's a lot of, of overlap there. So you see they do take some some coral like what we might call uh, a habitus or a sort of a morphology. So it's just the shape of these things. Um, th these are all marine representatives here. And so these are the sorts of things that you would see in a coral reef, uh, but they are these bryozoans. And so bryozoans, it's a group that you may not have heard of. Uh, so give you a little bit of you know, just background on where they're coming from. If they're not corals, what are they related to? So if you were around with us last month when we were talking about water bears, the tardigrades, uh, we mentioned these uh, major groups of invertebrate phyla. And one of them is the ichthyosaurs, the shedding animals. So these are things like arthropods and tardigrades and also some worms um, that have these chitinous cuticles that they shed as they grow. Uh, but then there's this other group that we didn't talk about, the Lophotrachozoa. And this is also a very, very species rich and important group of really incredibly diverse invertebrates that include such famous things as mollusks and annelid worms, uh, and maybe lesser known, but ecologically super important things like rotifers. 
And so this is, the name's a bit of a mouthful, Lofotrachozoa. Uh, that is a combination of sort of the two component groups, uh, which have trochophores and lophophores. It's like mollusk, trochophore larva, and then Uh, somehow, Christian, we can't hear you anymore. I wasn't sure if it was just me, but we lost your sound. Um, maybe try reconnecting your mic microphone. Sorry about that, everyone. We'll get this fixed ASAP. I think I hear you. Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah, for sure. Okay. All right. So let's just forego the microphone. Something is going wrong with that. Um, so let's get back to talking about lophophorates. Uh, again, this group of invertebrates uh, that has this, it's sort of a horseshoe shaped structure, um, which in brachiopods is inside of their shell. They're kind of like mimics of mollusks, but not closely related to mollusks. Uh, that has all these little tentacles on it in kind of a, a U-shaped pattern and it's used for filter feeding. So there are several phyla of these lophophorates. Uh, the brachiopods are, um, they're, individuals that have shells. There are pheronids, which may be part of brachiopods. It's, we don't know yet. They're sort of worm-like creatures that don't have shells or have lost the shells. And then of course, the group we're talking about today, the bryozoans. Um, so in this case, they, they're very similar in shape to these pheronids, only they're much, much smaller and then they are colonial. So uh, each of these is an individual animal, but they make up this larger colony. And so basically, they're constantly flicking out their tentacles, uh, getting little bits of detritus and plankton out of the water column in order to feed themselves. And then they have connections through each of their little compartments uh, so they, they can share with the colony. Um, so this is the most sort of typical morphology of a, of a bryozoan individual organism, a zoid. Uh, here's a diagram of what it looks like here. You can see that most of this is made up of the lophophore, that's structure at the top with all the tentacles. And other than that, it's really just kind of a stomach um, and a few muscles to pull in and out of their compartment. Um, really very, very small brain. Uh, they don't really have a circulatory system because their body is constantly uh, washed in surrounding fluid. So, you know, uh, Respiration, oxygen exchange just happens directly through the skin. Uh, they don't need lungs or really anything like that. Uh, so very sort of simple creatures in some ways, uh, but you know, very, very successful. And there is some complexity to them. So the individual zoids, like I show here are pretty simple, um, but they can, you know, the individual colonies or the collective colonies rather uh, sometimes they will have it, different types of zoids from compartment to compartment. So this is one type here called the vibraculum. So this is, uh, it's basically has this long whip-like structure on it, the, the seta. Um, and this is used to clean off the colony. So if they get like some goop or gunk on them, or if they get mud or something that's fouled the, the, uh, the in other compartments so that they can't filter feed, this will basically wipe it off uh, and you know, helps to keep the colony healthy. If the colony isn't getting enough food, it can also you know, take larger food objects and sort of like move it around and uh, put it where some of the other zoids can, can eat it. Um, so this is another one called the avicularium, which is my favorite of all the, the bryozoan bits of uh, you know, individual, uh, individuality here. Uh, it looks kind of like a bird's head, which is the source of the name, which basically kind of means sort of bird headed thing. And if you look at these are some scanning electron micrographs, so little microscope photos of it, uh, you'll see they really do look a lot like bird heads uh, at the edges of this ramifying bryozoan. So this is a branching bryozoan. It almost looks like sort of little enemies that you would find in an arcade game or something. Uh, but these these beaks, this, so they can close down, they can clamp on things. And they're mostly used actually to defend the bryozoan colony. 
So if little predators come by, they can try to sort of nip them away. Um, bryozoans, again, you know, they're, they're not like corals. They don't have venom. Uh, they don't have stingers of any kind. So they can't really defend themselves for the most part. And indeed, there are a lot of animals that will just kind of go around and vacuum up bryozoans once they find a colony. Like sea slugs love to eat bryozoans. A lot of marine worms will eat bryozoans. So the avicularia kind of help them fight back. Um, and in some cases are even used for predation. So there are uh, known cases of the avicularia biting down on worms and then the other zoids actually absorbing sort of the, the remnants of the worms that get chomped up there. Uh, so some limited carnivory uh, in bryozoans, but it seems like they're mostly for defense. And then sort of the last, uh, you know, weird non-standard bit of bryozoan anatomy are these things called statoblasts, which are present in the freshwater members of the group. So mentioned, you know, these are uh, aquatic animals and most of them are in marine environments, but there are some freshwater bryozoans and you can see these sort of like disc shaped structures forming underneath uh, the zoid in the figure to the right. And basically what's happening here with these statoblasts is so when you look at a freshwater bryozoan, they're very different from uh, the marine ones. So the marine ones, you know, look more like sort of coral shaped. Uh, this is a typical freshwater one, which is found in the Northern hemisphere in Europe and North America. And it's sort of like this big goo ball, almost kind of like a weird brain structure, but it is, it's a bryozoan. And, you know, they need to stay wet and they need, you know, they need good clean water in order to survive. And when conditions get bad, if the water body that they're in dries out or if it becomes contaminated somehow, um, the colony will just die off. And then how, how does the species survive and perpetuate? Well, it does so by producing these statoblasts, uh, which are, you know, you can almost kind of think of them as spore-like structures. You know, they're, they're obviously not real spores because these are, these are animals. These are not uh, fungi or plants. Um, but, you know, last month we were talking about how incredible tardigrades are at survival, um, that they can survive really extreme and inclement conditions. Uh, and particularly, you know, they'll go into what's called the ton state of, you know, they stop being these little squishy guys who walk around and they kind of just like retract into this very desiccated form. And then when things have stopped being so dry or so salty or so radioactive or whatever is hurting these poor tardigrades, um, they'll essentially come, come back to life. They'll come back from this state of extreme sort of torpor um, and start walking around again. So bryozoans, they can't really do that uh, you know, because they're a whole colony and uh, they're filter feeding. But what they will do is create these statoblasts, which uh, will stay, they can stay for years viable in the sediment. And then when conditions become better, they will hatch and a new bryozoan will come out of that and we'll be able to form a whole new colony from it. So important for the survival of bryozoans in these ephemeral waters. Um, just as a final uh, example of sort of the bryozoan diversity in freshwaters, uh, this is a, a genus I'm particularly fond of called Christotella. So this is, you can see it has almost sort of this slug-like shape, um, but all on its back, you can see all those individual zoids with their little, little tentacles coming up there. And so this is a very interesting taxon because it's actually one of the few motile bryozoans. So I mentioned that most of them are sessile, which means that they're fixed in place for their whole life. But there are a few bryozoan examples like this one here that are capable of, of movement where the whole colony will actually move around, uh, albeit very slowly. Um, but it is, it's cool that there's, they've somehow managed to create this kind of gestalt organism uh, that's even capable of, of movement as a unit. So really remarkable creatures. Yeah, this looks super cool. You know, the vast majority of bryozoans are sessile, and most of them are encrusters. So these are things that are reliant on a some sort of harder substrate in order to uh, lay down their colonies. So you see them a lot growing, encrusting things like like seaweed, like this red alga here. Um, they also love to encrust the shells of other organisms. So these are three examples of. Uh, one species of bryozoan, very colorful one, 
that is covering gastropod shells that actually are being used by hermit crabs. Um, so this is actually a photo taken by one of the, one of the world's few bryozoologists is right at our museum, uh, Megan McCuller, who's collections manager in invertebrates. So if you, if you do, or if you've become interested uh, in all our talk of bryozoans and wanna see some more amazing bryozoan photos, uh, please follow her on social media. Uh, but yeah, so most of these bryozoans, they're trying to encrust uh, structures and sometimes, you know, they can really go wild with it. So if you look, uh, the photo at the right there is a cross section of a bryozoan colony that has formed around a snail shell, a gastropod shell. And you can see that there are generations and generations of the colony just getting bigger and bigger around that core of the shell. So each of those layers in there is the skeleton of the bryozoan colony. It's you know, made of calcium carbonate, like a lot of marine invertebrates are. Uh, and of course, all the ones towards the core, they don't have live zoids in them anymore. Those only would have been present on the outside. So that's, those are, you know, the older ones would have died and then new ones butt off from there and then it's expanding outwards. And so because they do have this calcareous skeleton and it can you know, get pretty robust in cases like the one on the right, um, bryozoans, despite their sort of tiny size, actually have a remarkably good fossil record. So if you go really to any marine environments that preserve sort of carbonatic shells, you're very likely to find bryozoans. And there are, you know, hundreds and hundreds of species of these things known from the fossil record, uh, going back, you know, well into the, the Paleozoic. So uh, some of my favorite fossil bryozoans, this is my absolute favorite one here. This is a genus called Archimedes, uh, in part because it's an animal from the Permian, which is, you know, Permian and Triassic are the, the age that I work on. Um, so generally not working in the marine realm, but, you know, you do get uh, Archimedes in, in Permian reef faunas. Um, has this very cool spiral shape, which is almost unique among the group. Uh, named, of course, after the classical philosopher uh, who described this uh, ancient form of irrigation, uh, the Archimedes screw, uh, which is, you know, still in use today, but was very popular in sort of the ancient world um, and looks a lot like sort of the Archimedes colony. Uh, and another one that is represented by some really incredible fossils, this is, these are from the Ordovician of Estonia. Uh, this is a genus called Graptodictyon, which has this very broad, very coral-like, almost like a staghorn coral type morphology here. Um, another thing that's notable about Graptodictyon, you know, is the age. So it's from the Ordovician, and these were historically the earliest bryozoans known. So, you know, getting into the actual, you know, taken a while to give you the background of what bryozoans are, but now why are they important for paleontology? So if we go to our, you know, our geological time scale here, so Ordovician is back towards the beginning of the Paleozoic where we get these earliest bryozoans, but it's not all the way at the beginning. So there's an earlier period, the Cambrian, which is of course famous for the Cambrian explosion. This is when basically all of the major animal phyla, or at least the skeletonized animal phyla that we can you know, reasonably expect to have fossils of, they all appear at once in this grand flowering of animal diversity. The, the reasons for that are still hotly debated, um, but it is clear that most of the animal phyla, they are not present before the Cambrian and then they all kind of show up at once um, with one notable exception, which is bryozoans. So bryozoans, despite having a great fossil record, uh, from the Ordovician onwards were completely unknown in the Cambrian. And this was sort of like a huge gap in our understanding of basically the assembly of modern marine ecosystems is where are the bryozoans. So we know from their sister groups, you know, things like brachiopods, they must have been around in the Cambrian, um, but no Cambrian bryozoan fossils were known. It was a big mystery. So enter the news for the week uh, which is this fossil called proto um, So These are microscopic fossils. So you can see that this is only, uh, this is at 200 microns, the scale bar there. So really little things. This is in, again, microscope pictures, scanning electron micrographs. And so proto basically means ancient 
uh, honeycomb. And, you know, it's a pretty appropriate name. So it's just these, these little bits of, uh, you know, kind of like shell uh, that have this kind of like honeycomb structure with all these little compartments in them, uh, which by now should be, you know, pretty familiar to you. And, but this was, uh, so Protomolesion isn't an entirely new organism. It was named back in the, the 1990s. But the original fossils that were found were very incomplete and difficult to basically figure out what they were. So they were originally found in South Australia in you know, Cambrian rocks of uh, around 10 Mile Creek. So in the, the locality on the left there. Uh, and it was just one of many of what are called small shelly fauna. So just kind of like these, these bits of shell and integument and sort of chitinous bits that uh, when you look at microfossils in the Cambrian, you find a lot of just like weird little bits and bobs that sometimes, you know, you're able to uh, put in a sort of a higher taxonomic group, a higher sort of clade, like a phylum or something. Um, but a lot of them are just total mysteries. And so proto Proto-Molician was in that category uh, until, you know, just in, you know, the past few weeks, a new paper came out revealing new proto Proto-Molician specimens, both from Australia and importantly from South China, from a site that has truly spectacular preservation at the micro scale, um, which has allowed the anatomy of proto Proto-Molician to be understood in greater detail than ever before. And the conclusions of the authors on this are that it is one, it is, uh, it's a, a colonial structure. So these, these are individual compartments, each of which would have housed a different organism and the define the detail of this structure is essentially indistinguishable from modern biozoans. So there are a few sort of what we would call plesiomorphic features, primitive features to this suggesting that it's a very early divergence from the group. Uh, but the, basically the, the data is there showing that this is the, the long sought after Cambrian bryozoan. So we, we finally filled in that last gap in sort of the skeletonized invertebrate record uh, for the Cambrian explosion. And so have a little you know, illustration on the left there of what the proto Proto-Molician colony may have looked like when it was alive. So sort of a, a simple columnar structure, not quite as um, elaborate as you get both in modern bryozoans and then in Ordovician bryozoans, um, but still you know, a sort of a pretty typically bryozoan looking thing. So this pulls the origin of bryozoans from the Ordovician back to the Cambrian. And that might not seem like a huge jump just from one period to another. Uh, but one, you know, you're dealing with tens of millions of years, which is a lot to begin with. Uh, but also it's just the, uh, you know, it's really the, the, their absence from the fossil record was, was very problematic and telling for the, basically for the story of animal diversity uh, that basically the paradigm we've been working under for, for years and years. So they were expected to be back there, uh, but there was, it was always a mystery. So uh, finding them at, you know, at small size is, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, so that at the time, you know, they were not these hugely robust skeletonized structures that you see after the Ordovician Marine Revolution and then have present, you know, all the way up to the modern day. So humble beginnings uh, for these, these noble bryozoans, but good to know a little bit more about where they're coming from. Yeah, I, I love the name that they chose for this species because I feel like, you know, not only did it look like honeycomb, but also so, the paleontologists probably felt like they were like, they had struck gold. Like finally we found this missing piece. You know, and um, I mean, we also we often like kind of in our culture kind of like refer to honey as gold, you know, uh -huh. and so I don't know. I like that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and, yeah, if you're a paleozoic bryozoologist, um, you know, Cambrian bryozoans, the definite holy grail. So <laughs> everyone in in that subfield, super excited about this. Yeah, and I don't really know a whole lot about bryozoans, so this is really, um, I'm really glad that I can talk to you directly about this. And I had a question about one of the pictures you showed us, sure. the um, the slug-like one that is nothing like a slug, but kind of superficially looks like a slug. Yeah, um, 
Yeah, so there were these kind of long antenna looking things coming out of it. Were those the sete that you mentioned that like will clean the body, I guess, of the bryozoan? From the, from the, the vibracula? Yeah. Um, let me pull it up. I don't think so. Or are those just not connected even to yeah, this organism? No, so those are not part of, the, part of the organism. So those are parts of algae that are in the community where it's, it's living. So the long sort of almost the thread-like structures there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are part of sort of the surrounding water weeds that it's crawling over. Cool. How big can bryozoans get to be? Um, I mean, the individual zoids are all tiny. So, you know, most of them are a few millimeters at most. Um, bryozoan colonies can get pretty big, but none of them, uh, to my knowledge, on the scale of something like a coral. So they don't, uh, at least in terms of density, I'm trying to think, because I, mean, I mean, they can encrust basically infinitely. So you can get a colony that is encrusting all the way up the 100 feet of a kelp frond. So, I mean, that's pretty big, but, you know, each of that is like only a millimeter thick. So they can get wide, but not deep, I guess is what I would say. Okay. They're, they, they sprawl, but they can't like, okay. Yeah. Very cool. And I, okay. So can those, the little bird heads that look like they like, you know, would nip at you? Yeah. Can avicularia. they? Yeah. Avicularia. Thank you. Do they actually have any effect on people? Like if we came across them, could they like, you know, I know we, we probably can't see them, no, but could they, could, would we feel them at all? <laughs> no, they're so tiny. It would like, they could not, they couldn't break your skin. They probably wouldn't even, oh. you, know, you wouldn't even be able to see them. It's a whole other world going on in the microscopic realm. Yeah. I love it. Um, so, I was wondering what gives them their color? Like you showed the picture that I think was actually from uh, Megan McCuller. Yeah. And um, yeah, I was just wondering, like, I, you know, I, we always see really cool fossils and I know fossils get their color from like the mineral deposits that are in the area where they fossilize. So have, you, have we found colorful bryozoan fossils? Um, I guess that's two questions like rolled together in one. <laughs> Um, I actually don't know what distinguishes the colors in the modern one and why single species like that one there can have such a broad range of colors. I would suspect it has to do with what they're eating, um, but yeah, really don't know. Uh, we don't, to my knowledge, have fossils uh, with color for bryzoans. I think that we've got, you know, we've shown before in these incredible preservational regimes, these Lagerstätten, uh, that you do sometimes get color preserved. Uh, but those are, you know, in marine environments, you're generally not getting much in the way of color in these really ancient things. So you'll get some more recent shells that have like the mother of pearl preserved or some banding or sp spots on them. But for really tiny things like the bryozoans, that also tend to be the same color throughout, I, I can't think of any. Hmm. Okay. Um, and this is probably a silly question, but for animals that, you know, colonize like um, bryozoans, what is the difference between an animal like that and then, you know, like, fish or birds that can like create this formation where they like look like they're moving all together as one unit, you know, what are, what, why is it different? Okay. Uh, so, I mean, for that, I guess the, like the fish and the birds, they do, they, they can move as a unit, but they are, they're more individuals than the individuals in the bryzone colony are. So like, the, they, like the birds aren't connected by a tube, which the bryozoans <laughs> are. Um, Important distinction. Yeah. <laughs> but also the birds, like the way the bryozoans reproduce, you know, the, the bird doesn't, you know, sort of like 
pop off a little mini bird off the side of its face that then hangs. But that that would be so cute if it did. (laughs) Weird. That then hangs around as a new little like compartment of skeleton is formed around it. Um, So it like colonial animals, it's, they're difficult for individual, like purely individually operating animals like ourselves to comprehend in some ways. Um, They do operate more similarly to plants and fungi than a lot of the animals that we know do. Uh, Especially since like some of them, you know, they, they really require the whole colony in order to survive. So like, for example, thinking about another type of colonial animal is the Portuguese man of war, uh, which looks like a jellyfish, but actually mm-hmm. a different group of cnidarians called uh, siphonophores. So for that, the, the floaty bit on top, the gas bladder that allows it to float on top of the ocean is a different animal. It's a different individual than the tentacles, which actually poison, well, envenomate fish and that's what it eats. Um, and it needs both of those to survive. So jellyfish are similar and have kind of both those things too, but as one organism. So it is what, you know, what is the self? (laughs) What what, what, what is an individual, like what is the difference between having a, you know, two different types of organisms that are needed to form a successful colony between us needing a brain and a heart and lungs in order to form ourselves. So a lot of it just comes down to definition. A lot of it comes down to, you know, how reproduction occurs, whether or not they have independent nervous systems, whether they come from different eggs or sort of different parents. Um, There is, I guess, what we should take away from this is that there's sort of like a, a vast spectrum of being in this wild world of ours and you know, organisms filling in basically everything you can think of. And uh, I love that. And also, I did not expect this um, episode to get so philosophical (laughs) about what is it to be? (laughs) Bryozoans, they really make you think. They really do. Hmm. Um, (laughs) So I'm going to move on to my next question. Folks out there watching, don't forget, you can type in your questions into the chat if you have them. Although I do want to know, oh wait, actually, um, Anne pointed out something awesome in the chat that, you know, we've also got our internal bacterial biome, well, mm-hmm. internal and external, right? They live on our skin too. Um, yeah, so that is another great point. Yeah, what does it mean to be? Hmm. Yeah, like, cause we can't, we can't exist without sort of the microorganisms that are symbiotic in us. And of yeah. course, you know, uh, that's been going on for so many millions of years that some some of those microorganisms permanently became part of us, like the mitochondria, which are, you know, in eukaryotes, they have mitochondria in the cells, prokaryotes don't. And now it's pretty well, well accepted that mitochondria are endosymbiotic prokaryotes that were absorbed by bigger cells. And then, you know, their whole being uh, including their DNA, is perpetuated through eukaryotes like ourselves. Wow. So organisms that have fused uh, to create a superorganism. I feel like someone could write an entire like thesis paper based on oh, it's, the, it's the last five minutes of this conversation. <laughs> uh, that's really cool. Um, I guess going back to basics, you may have mentioned this and I might have missed it. So if so, I'm sorry. Um, but why exactly are they called moss animals? Uh, I mean, they, they look kind of mossy. I mean, they okay. are animals, but you know, especially like moss is as plants go is very low to the ground. All of the little moss stems kind of look the same. They all kind of have this little, you know, kind of crown like structure at the top. So, you know, they're moss, they're kind of, they form kind of a creeping mat on the forest floor. Uh, so very similar to uh, most of the bryozoans that are these low level encrusters. Um, there are of course those spectacular uh, sort of the high rise bryozoans, things like Raptodictyon and Archimedes that form these very complex, more coral-like colonies. But most of them are sort of like the, the low to the ground ones. 
Mm -hmm. Very okay. useful, like. So yeah, I wasn't sure if they could, you know, also live in moss, um, like the tardigrades that we talked about. Um, yeah. Yeah, they need to be in a fully aquatic environment as filter okay. feeders. So they can't, the, the tardigrades are mostly aquatic, but then in like, when it, because they're also because the, they're microscopic, when it's really damp, a single dew drop is a whole world to them. Yeah. So, you know, they can exist in wet stuff on the surface, but even like if you're living, if you're really small, uh, if you need to filter feed, you really constantly need fluid flow in order for that to be a viable, uh, you know, mode of, of feeding. So most of the times, you know, in the ocean where there are currents is ideal. And then there are some of these that are living in rivers and streams and things, these freshwater ones. Uh, but you know, they can't live on the surface. Okay. Yeah. I bet I've found, you know, bryozoans and not even realized it. Like when you showed that picture of the goo ball, yeah. I was like, probably have found that out swimming in a lake and never even realized what it actually was. Or anytime you are beachcombing. So they love old shells, like really tons and tons of shells will have bryozoans on them if you look carefully. And sometimes it's, you know, you pick up like a big scallop or something at the beach and you like, you dust the sand off and then you see like other little crumply stuff. So you rub it off. That could be a bryozoan colony. Oh no. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, if, it's on, if it's at the surface, it's already dead. It's just the skeleton of it. Right. Just, like, you know, yeah. you are, uh, you know, you might be encountering bryozoans and not even recognizing them. Mm -hmm. So yeah, next time you're beachcombing, keep it, keep an eye out. I will keep an eye out and um, I guess, would it be helpful to take like a little uh, magnifying glass, you know? And Yeah, I mean, always. I mean, there's so much <laughs> little stuff out there in the natural world. Yeah. Um, I mean, mo for the most part, like paleontologists and geologists, we always have a little hand lens in the field to try to get, you know, a really close view at the stuff we've found. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Um, and Anne had a great question. So... You know, sometimes when building, um, they'll use material that's, you know, fossiliferous stone, stone with lots of fossils in it. Um, are most of those fossils moss animals, bryozoans? So not for the most part. So they never get dense enough to form the majority of a rock. So like, for example, like you, a lot of real microorganisms, you can get forming whole rocks like uh, diatoms, radiolarians, foraminiferans. Um, I, we talked about diatomaceous earth, I think, in the past. Mm -hmm. um, so you do get just like chock a block full of those uh, fossil plankton. And then you also get in some fossil limestones that are really, really full, especially in the Paleozoic of things like crinoids and brachiopods. And you'll get bryozoans in there too, but they're not the majority of it. Uh, so especially in the Southeastern United States, when you get um, fossilized rock that's used for building, most of that is Cenozoic, so relatively recent shell hash. So that's, and that's mostly gonna be mollusks. So mollusks and coral. So especially in like coastal areas, both in North Carolina and then in states like Florida, where it's all historically, at least coastal, it was all underwater. Um, it's mostly coral and mollusk shell. So there could well be bryzoans in there. And if you look very carefully, I'm sure you'll find some. Uh, but yeah, it's just, again, they're just too thin to be a major part of the biomass. Mm -hmm. And Miranda also had a great question. Um, we're going back to when you're beachcombing and you find, you know, stuff on seashells. Um, and uh, they're asking, what about the things on a dead Atlantic horseshoe crab? Could those okay. possibly? Yeah. So I think a lot of the, the encrusters you find on horseshoe crabs are things that were there when they were alive, like they'll get barnacles on them, for instance, they're animals that want the horseshoe crab to be alive, because then that moves them around through the water column. So it's uh, at least, you know, you want, you don't want to like be washed up on shore, which horseshoe crab skeletons often are. Uh, with that said, a lot of like 
crustacean, like the cast off of their shells, especially as they're bigger, if they are in like deeper marine environments where they're not just getting washed up on shore, uh, that's perfectly fine substrate for any of these encrusters. And indeed in sandy bottoms, they're really kind of struggling to find any surfaces. So anything that is, is hard and stable uh, on sandy or muddy bottoms that they can attach to, they will. So in those cases, yeah, something like a horseshoe crab shell or a crab shell of any kind, or like a, you know, a cuttlefish bone, uh, anything they will, they will encrust. Mm -hmm. All right, well, that's good to know. Um... So I'm thinking about how the bryozoan fossils, you know, you said that one reason it was uh, weird mm -hmm. that they were not found from Cambrian fossil uh, places because it's just so common to find these bryozoan fossils in all the other, you know, later time periods. Um, and so are bryozoans as common today as they were, you know, prehistorically? Are they experiencing any type of population decline, like you know corals? I mean, I know they're a completely different group, but do you know if they're at risk? Okay, well, so two questions there. Uh, one, sort of deep time record of bryozoans from the Ordovician onwards, they seem to have been very abundant. So it seems they were part of what was called the Great Ordovician uh, Biodiversification Event where a lot of, so the Cambrian explosion brings all the phyla into the sea basically. Um, but some of them, some of the things that we consider like well-known marine animals, even in the Paleozoic are not major players in the Cambrian. So things like cephalopods, like nautiloids, the ancient ancestors mm -hmm. of squids and octopuses. Uh, we know the earliest cephalopods were around in the Cambrian, but you don't really see much of their fossils. But they become very, very common in the Ordovician. Um, also things like Eurypterids, sea scorpions start, uh, a lot of the trilobite groups, um, a lot of the brachiopod groups, they really all take off in the Ordovician. And so bryozoans are among them. We, we now know based on proto Proto-Molysseon that there were these, these little bryozoans, uh, in the Cambrian, but then they really seem to diversify and become larger in the Ordovician. Um, and then, you know, they've, gone, they've gotten through all the major mass extinctions up to the present day. Uh, I don't think they will die out now as a phylum, but certainly individual uh, bryzoan species are hugely at risk. And there are a lot of risks to bryzoan diversity. Um, one, just like all sessile filter feeding animals are kind of having a rough go of it at the moment due to, you know, there's pollution issues, getting mm -hmm. microplastics in them, um, breakdown of the ocean currents due to changes in global warming that they rely on. Um, ocean acidity is a huge concern for them because they have those calcium carbonatic skeletons. Um, it is much more difficult for them to skeletonize as waters become more acidic. And so when, you, and it's one thing like people have been doing studies on gastropods, on crustaceans and things, seeing their shells becoming thinner uh, and when you've got a big bulky shell like a gastropod, that's, it's, a, it's a concern, uh, but it's not necessarily the end of the world. But when you've just got this tiny little lattice of you know, lacy stuff, uh, that becomes a real problem if that's just dissolving in the water. So yeah, so there is, there's worries to be had for prize zones. Um, but you know, the, I guess the upside of that is they are, they are survivors. Uh, you know, they, they can deal with some, at least some of them, with really extreme environments. Um, we don't really know how long saddle blasts can remain viable. For all we know, you know, hundreds of years down the line. Wow. So after, in, you know, ruins of civilization, humans extinct, <laughs> saddle blasts pop open, dry zones come right on back. Uh, so <laughs> That would be cool. Yeah. I mean, not the human extinction part. Well, no, but... we don't want that. We don't want that. I mean, <laughs> the rest of it. Yeah. A, worse, a worse case scenario. But yeah, uh, but yeah we definitely want the prize zones to stick around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, thank you for answering that complicated question. And no um, don't worry, folks, if there's, you know, if you ever get stressed out about all of these different species that we learn about that are being harmed by climate change, um, there are lots of things that we can do, right, to, to help out. Um, 
I, one thing you can do is just limit pollution, right? Um, you can spread the, spread the word, right? You can go tell everyone you know what you learned in programs like these, right? Be your own little climate ambassador. Um, and on that note, <laughs> Christian, I, we don't have any other questions and that's all the time we have today for old news. But I wanted to say thank you, everyone, for your questions and your comments. Um, Christian, of course, thank you for your expertise. Oh, my pleasure. And um, if you want to join us for the next program, it's going to be December 14th. So at 1 p.m. Eastern time, we hope to see you there. And don't forget, you can register and you will receive reminder emails and supplemental resources like bingo and bingo vocabulary. And I'm super excited. We have a new resource. We have this awesome anatomy guide that was um, illustrated by one of our colleagues, Alexander Luke. So um, we really love this and you can print this off for free if you um, if you register, you'll get that in your email. And uh, I also wanted to let you all know um, that on our YouTube channel tomorrow, we're going to have a full day of virtual programs related to evolution and mammal evolution, especially oh, because it, yeah, it's going to be Darwin days. So we hope you can join us and guess who has a program tomorrow, actually, um, Dr. Christian Kammerer. Yeah, so so if you'd like to hear how to make a mammal, you can join him for that program tomorrow. Um, I'll probably art. say that again. The forbidden art of mammal. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> well, I think I'll be there too. So I, I'm excited. And um, yeah, we hope to see you all tomorrow for Darwin Day programs. Thank you so much for joining. Have a great day. Have a great day, everyone. Stay safe out there. Bye.